I bet you didn't know that Martin Luther knew English. But, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, for those of you online, and even here, we're trying a little bit of an experiment this morning in that we're going to spotlight this area using the Zoom camera uh, during the, the uh, sermon time. So those online can see something other than just my face at that point. All right. So we're trying this as an experiment. Good day for experiment. And, and today we have an interesting mix of celebrations. First is the liberation we experience from the Reformation. Martin Luther and his bold 95 thesis to be debated the excitement of our connections to being saved by God through grace of God. Now, wasn't it wonderful to have Martin Luther here himself to deliver those words to us? Then our second element is we have the psalmness of All Saints Day, the recognition of those who have passed. Our short text that I'm going to read from, from, the, from John, 1 John, not to be confused with the Gospel of John, 1 John is one of those letters that just right there before Revelations, it's hard to find because it's a very short there towards the end of the Bible. But some powerful words for us this morning. It gives us hope for the saints who have preceded us in death while reminding us of our current identity as God's children. We experience God's grace in the midst of what we can call an overwhelming world. Let's listen for God's word in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. See what love the Father has given, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it does not know him. Beloved, we are children of God now. What we will be has yet to be revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I think we can relate to this passage more completely if we understand some of the historical context of it. I would contend it's very parallel to things that we're experiencing in our world today. Alicia Myers describes this text as kind of a hinge or a transition between two related segments of this short letter. It flows from chapter two, where the writer admonishes the readers not to follow those who would deny the truth about Christ as the Son of the Father. In practical terms, 1 John addresses a congregation traumatized by rupture, torn apart by those who have gone beyond the confession that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and have bolted from the church. It may be an over-dramatization to characterize those who are not with us in worship today as having bolded from the church. But whether they are part of the generation that has just drifted away or separated for expressed theological differences, their absence causes us great anguish. Anguish that needs to be acknowledged and addressed. Our status does not give us ability to does give us ability to empathize with the anguish and challenges faced by the early church. One of the primary aims of 1 John is to persuade the remaining members that they had good reason to hold on to their confession of Christ as the Son of God. Hold on because they had experienced it as truth in their very existence as a community, a community of children of God. The, the child language rings true with the writers continually addressing them as little children and little ones throughout. The, the child's language in the first John is not pejorative. It rather ties back to the actual gospel of John, 
where its prologue says, quote, to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave power to become children of God. And then it continues, who were born not of blood of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. Born of the will of God. They, we, are truly children of God. In 1 John, we, the present reality that we are God's children is the foundation of our future hope. Just before, the writer reminds the readers of, of the confidence they are to have, that they will not be put to shame before Jesus when he returns, rather that they are to be bold, come in boldness when they approach their fellow siblings from God's family. Our reading today further details this image of boldness. Not only will children approach boldly, but they will be like him, that is, like Jesus. Why? Because they will see him just as he is. The image is that children of God will be fully transformed by complete vision of Christ so that their own bodies will become like his. Verse 3 then goes on to say, And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as Christ is purified. It can be, it, this rounds out the message of hope, but it needs a little extra attention and explanation. Extra attention lest we misinterpret. Purity could be translated here more accurately as moral sincerity and unimpeachable integrity. Using these translations to sum up the sense of our reading of God's future for both Christians and Christ flows from the faithful integrity in the presence of God as parent. We can present ourselves as morally sincere with unimpeachable integrity, just like Christ. Having hope in him can make us morally sincere, help us to be unimpeachable in our integrity. Now, I admit childlike, often we associate with being immature. Precisely how children will mature over time is impossible to predict. We know children often tend to resemble their parents. We have sayings for this, like mother, like daughter, like father, like son. That's how the sayings goes. Here we can rely on like father, like son, meaning like God, like Christ. This follows to like Christ, like believer, the believer who is a child of God. Clifton Black points out in characteristic Johnian fashion, this last observation leads us back to the text's beginning, where it says, see what love the Father has given us. Neither here nor anywhere in 1 John is our integrity or our purity a precondition for being God's children. Quite the contrary. The scripture tells us little children you are from God, tells us God sent his only son in the world so that we might live through him, tells us we love because he first loved us. That's a reformation, affirmation, if I ever heard one. We know from our own observations that Christians are in no way self-made, mature creatures of purity. We are not perfect. Our vocation as believers emphasizes in, emphasized in 1 John is to respond to God's prior and ongoing action for us, the children of God, to be a responsible agent. The children of God is to be an agent enabled to respond because of the investment of God's anticipatory love. We continue to grow in and through God's love. Recognizing that God's anticipatory love, <coughs> a love 
that differentiates us as children of God and as saints allows us to claim observation of All Saints Day. Now, the term saint, saint in our common vernacular has become abused to the point of near incomprehensible. On the one hand, we have a football team called the Saints who play in a particular city not known for being particularly saintly. We have those saints, even if their behavior may be challenged as being saintly. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we in the Roman Catholicism, we have saints as persons in heaven who lived heroically virtuous lives, offered their life for others, or were martyred for the faith, who are fully worthy of imitation. Neither version of saint is particularly helpful to us on All Saints Day. But 1 John can be a resource for us today. In this letter, sanctity does not refer to the impossible vision to be complete goodness now or even in some coming age. Even in our humanness, we are called to abide in Christ and to be fully anointed by his truthful teaching. To be children of God is a divine gift that gives us a defined vocation. The church's truth wells up from and is channeled by God's calling to each of us as his children, calling us to be saints together as the church, calling us to live in the same love by which God has loved us, even with our imperfections. Today on All Saints Sunday, we give thanks to God for those who have abided in divine love, who have educated us in love because he first loved us. Then we go on to redirect ourselves to the heritage of that company of saints. Rededicate ourselves to be called to walk in the light as he himself is the light and to have fellowship with one another. We are called to be the church. Like the original readers of John's first letter, people like us gather for worship in churches around the world today. <clears throat> we benefit from a reminder that God has already bestowed upon us the very thing that is most important for being people we are called to be. We are children of God. Already today, now, forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now let us 